Charles Dickens' life is kind of like something out of a Charles Dickens novel, which is probably not a coincidence. Uh, he was born in 1812 in England, and he was the second of eight children. That's kind of a lot of children. And things were going super well for a while, which is not like a Charles Dickens novel. Um, and the family, you know, they moved into a fancy house. They had servants. He was even going to private school. Things were great. Uh, he read a ton. He read Daniel Defoe, you know, Robinson Crusoe, things like that, Henry Fielding. And he also was really into the Arabian Nights. You know, that's where like Alibaba and Aladdin, all those stories come from. But then it all came to kind of an abrupt halt when his father was thrown into debtor's prison in 1824. And as I guess was common then, also his mother and siblings were sent to debtor's prison at the same time. That's a, that seems a little excessive, but oh well. And you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, he kind of ends up, you know, like the Fresh Prince in reverse, essentially. In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground is where I spent most of my days. You know, in, instead of starting out in West Philly and going to Bel Air, he started out in Bel Air and went to West Philly alone at age 12. West Philly in London at that time was a factory analogy, <laughs> maybe my analogy is wearing thin. Um, basically, he had, yeah, he had to go work at a factory at age 12 that was overrun with rats, and you know, he had a fairly posh existence was basically unended, and it traumatized him. And you know, because suddenly he's one of like a ton of child laborers, which he wasn't really all that familiar with before. And what's even kind of worse is that after his family did eventually get out of prison. His mother wanted him to keep working at the factory, so he gets his family back, but he's still stuck. He's still stuck doing this kind of awful job, and fortunately, at least he did get to go back to school. His father got him into a school in London, and you know, saving him sort of a, from a life of factory stuff forever. And you know, then even more financial problems kind of force him out of school in 1827. He starts working as a law firm clerk. He also works as a reporter, which kind of hones his writing a bit. 1830, he falls in love with a woman named Maria Biednell. Um, her parents didn't approve, so <laughs> they send her off to finishing school in Paris to get her away from him. 1836, he must have totally forgotten about her because he married a woman named Catherine Hogarth. Then go on to have 10 children, which is like, whoa, kind of a lot. Um, it's like two Brady Bunches or half a Duggar clan. And it's a bunch of kids, but it is nothing compared to his literary output. He has tons, tons of books. Um, he published his first short story in 1833. This was quickly followed by a flood of novellas, novels, plays, many, many stories. He wrote a ton. Uh, his first kind of fully fledged novel was called The Posthumous Papers of the Pickwick Club, or just shortly known as the Pickwick Papers. And it was published in 19 monthly installments from 1836 to 1837. It's kind of a collection of, of stories loosely connected to each other. And you know, in Pickwick, Pickwick Papers was actually kind of like an original, you know, Star Wars of its time in a lot of ways. Like there were spin-offs, there were bootleg versions, there were stage shows, merchandising, merchandising. Um, all I was really missing was a terrible Christmas special. We will get to Charles Dickens' Christmas special later. You should also check out the Star Wars Christmas special because it is hilarious. We meet Chewbacca's family. It is awful. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's also it, so this is kind of the beginning of a hugely successful and prolific career for Dickens. Um, next comes Oliver Twist, which is published again in installments, 1838, and this is about a miserable orphan boy stuck in a workhouse. Which, if that sounds familiar, probably is, right? Dickens drew on his own experiences to write this, and it's actually been adapted into a musical called Oliver, which was then adapted into a movie version that I never saw, but I watched the preview a ton of times on Disney VHS. Please, sir, I want some more. So after that, there are several more novels, including Nicholas Nickleby and The Old Curiosity Shop. 1842, Dickens goes to America, um, and he comments on a variety of stuff. He really throwing his opinion out there. Um, important things like condemning slavery, uh, <laughs> losing battle type things like the rampant piracy of all of his novels. You might, I mean, can you imagine like pirating books, right, instead of music? I guess that was the world. Although people do apparently pirate Kindle editions, like rebel nerds, I guess, I don't know. And you know, so Dickens hated that people were making illegal copies of his books and he wasn't getting paid. Now, kind of ironic, right now he's all over the internet because he's in the public domain. He's probably rolling over in his grave about that, but them's the breaks, them's the berries. Um, <laughs> back in England, he, he completed A Christmas Carol in 1843, and this was his special Christmas book. And you're probably familiar with this one, right? It's about a guy, about a guy named Ebenezer Scrooge, and there's three ghosts. 
I've ever seen a Muppet Christmas Carol or heard someone say, Merry Christmas, everyone. Right, that's all from this. Um, <laughs> you know how people always like complain about Christmas starting in June or whatnot? Like, Christmas wasn't always like that. It wasn't always this months long shebang with parties and TV specials and Mariah Carey and whatnot. But, you know, oh, the movie Love Actually, which I hate and watch every year, even so. Um, it was a Christmas carol that started all of this off, right? It kind of sparked interest in Christmas as this real festive holiday in Britain and in the U.S. And it was kind of this is all getting going at the same time. The whole decorating the Christmas tree thing, the month-long celebration. You know, if they had TV, they'd probably be producing those annoying Gap Christmas commercials. We all have Char we have Charles Dickens to thank for all of this. So, thank you, Charles Dickens. Um, <laughs> sounding a lot like Scrooge right now, aren't I? But so Dickens, he wrote four more Christmas novels, actually, but <laughs> we're not going to talk about those because we're sick of Christmas already. 1849, he publishes David Copperfield, which is his kind of most directly autobiographical novel, and it's about his days training to be the world's greatest magician. No, it's not. <laughs> not that David Copperfield. Um, it's just about a, a kid, a guy. He has many adventures. He meets lots of interesting people. There's not really any magic. I just said that to get you interested in it. Uh, Bleak House in 1853, Hard Times in 1854. This is not sounding so fun anymore, right? This is not some, g you couldn't even pretend that there was magic in those. And you know, Bleak House actually is, I, I jest, but Bleak House actually is one of his more popular novels. Um, it's got lots of interesting characters. It you know, kind of got cool interwoven subplots. Um, it's also a critique of the British judicial system, so you can... <laughs> <laughs> Make your own judgments about how interesting that would be to you. 1857, uh, Dickens, he was starring actually in a play that he'd written called The Frozen Deep, and he fell in love with Ellen Ternan, who was one of the actresses who was playing opposite him. And anybody, like, how did he have time to fall in love while he was in a play that he'd written and writing all his other stuff? I don't know. I guess he had his priorities straight, but... Even worse than all of that, right, he was 45 and she was 18, and you might have forgotten about his wife and their 10 children, but he had her too, so this was kind of not that nice. He got totally busted when a jeweler delivered a gold bracelet to his wife that had a note from Dickens to Ellen, his mistress, which is totally what happens in Love Actually, which is weird that now I've mentioned that twice in a video, even though I don't like it very much. Um, so he got separated from his wife, and they didn't get divorced because... You couldn't do that back then, especially if you're famous. But Dickens would actually go on to kind of support Ellen for the rest of his life and then traveled around together and probably annoyed the hell out of his wife. And, you know, with his new muse, uh, Dickens completed two of his really biggest hits. So he published Great Expectations in 1861 and Tale of Two Cities in 1859. And even if you've never read A Tale of Two Cities, you probably know how it starts, right? It's the best of times, it was the worst of times, yada, yada, yada. The no it's set in, wait for it, two cities. That should be a quiz question. How many cities is Tale of Two Cities set in? Five! Uh, you know, it's in London and Paris are the two cities of the title during the French Revolution. And the plot kind of deals with, you know, the good and the evil that comes from overthrowing the French aristocracy. You know, right, best of times, worst of times, right? He's letting you know right from the beginning that we've got, we're dealing in opposites. And we, we have a whole lesson on that, so you'll, we'll talk more about Tale of Two Cities. Great Expectations is about an orphan named Pip. Again, there's those orphans. Um, he's helping out a convict, so that is a heartwarming story. He falls in love with a girl named Estella, who is being taken care of by this really strange old woman named Miss Havisham. And Miss Havisham lives in kind of a decaying old mansion, wearing a wedding dress and generally just being weird. And you know, you get to learn all. I have a video on that one too, so we can learn more about that together as you know later. But a fun fact about Great Expectations is that Pip was Daniel Radcliffe, remember Harry Potter. It was his first film, to, you know, film or TV role. It was, you know, it's kind of how he got his start, how he got discovered to be Harry. So, that's cool. Uh, Dickens, you know, he was pretty prolific for a while. It declined around 1865. Um, June 9th of that year, he was actually in a like an almost deadly train accident. Well, it was deadly for lots of people. All these cars like plunged off a bridge. His didn't, but he was kind of rattled by that. He wrote a little ghost story about it called The Signal Man. And then five years, you know, kind of five years later to the day, he died. It was 1870, and he was really one of the most popular authors in England, in Victorian England at the time. So 
you know, we'll, we'll kind of dive more into sort of individual styles and themes as we go. I mentioned we're going to discuss several of these novels in more depth. An important thing to know about Dickens, I mentioned this with, with regard to a couple of the books. Most of his works were published serially, which means that they were kind of published in sections as he wrote them in magazines, like TV episodes, basically. Again, they didn't have TV, so they had to make do with what they had. And this kind of publication schedule can really change you know, how you conceive of a novel, how it evolves. So that's something that's important to keep in mind with regard to his stuff. It's also important that he loved a good satire, right? He, he liked to comment on social issues, particularly class and poverty. And you know, his satire can be funny, it can also be kind of alarming. He was really into like railing against social conditions, you know, especially in factories and you know, the things that he had experienced. And for upper class readers, this shocked them. He kind of really opened the door on a lot of this stuff that was going on. He also is really into, he c sort of combines awful realism, kind of harrowing realism, right, like this poor Oliver Twist, his early life, alongside like very idealized things as well. So like the transformation of Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. And there's also, he's not shy to be sentimental. Um, Oliver Twist is ridiculously sentimental. Right, the character is so, he's good, he's pure, he's kind of virtuous to the point of being obnoxious. You know, th this is not something that Dickens is, is trying to avoid. Um, you know, you can find some fault with Oliver and with characters like him, but Dickens has also got some great characters, you know, <laughs> if they're realistic or complex or kind of caricatures. He's got great names in particular. He's got the Artful Dodger, Inspector Bucket, Martin Chuzzlewit, Mrs. Snagsme, Mr. Fezziwig, Uriah Heep, right? These are great names. These are awesome. Um, so that you'll have those to look forward to as you enter the wild world of Charles Dickens. So to sum things up, uh, he is Victorian England's really most acclaimed and popular novelist. From you know, He wrote a ton. His early life was kind of rough. He was, you know, in, had money, and then he was in poverty, and then he had to do child labor. But he ends up using this for a lot of his writing. You know, he writes Oliver Twist, which is about orphans, much like he experienced. David Copperfield, Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, that Christmas Carol thing that you can thank for Christmas Palooza every year. And you know he's noted for his, his use of satire, his kind of social critiques, um, realism, sentimentalism, kind of side by side, and really vivid, memorable characters with awesome names like Chuzzlewit. So yeah, that is that is Charles Dickens.